Hi guys, it's Kamil here. Welcome to the Lit Talk, a casual segment on my channel where I talk about what I read, am reading and what I'm planning to read next. <laughs> I was recording this series in 2018, then in 2019 I disappeared to Cairo and for 8 months I didn't record anything. So let's try again in the new 2020, hoping for a longer strike this year. I haven't yet summarized January, so today we will talk about what I read in January, what am I currently reading and what I'm planning on reading next. I think I already said that. Yeah, all right, okay. I'll start from physical books, obviously that I've read, both in fiction and non-fiction departments. Then I'll talk about audiobooks I ran in January with, also both fiction and non-fiction. There's a reason I'm structuring it this way, and that to be revealed later on. Mysterious side to what can be read. <laughs> I told you it will be casual, okay? At the end of this video, I'll talk about how I was handling my New Year's reading resolution in January, obviously, and I'll wrap it up talking about my plans for February. So, physical books, starting from fiction. The first novel I've read this year in physical form was This Mammoth of a Book, the latest novel from Olga Tokarczuk, that already has its English title, The Books of Jacob, even though English-speaking world needs to wait for it till March 2021. I believe, and I'm not the only one, that this is so far her magnum opus. I'm saying so far as Tokarczuk, regardless of Nobel Prize, still has a long career ahead of herself. She is 58 years old right now only. What is The Books of Jacob about? This is a very well-researched historical novel focusing on Jewish sects from the 18th century that reads like a fable. You know, Tokarczuk has this quirk about herself, the way she builds narration, the language she uses, the well-balanced usage of magical realism, all that helps to create very her own atmosphere of a dark fable. Here in this novel, we follow the life of Jacob Frank, Jewish mystic, a historical figure, a self-proclaimed Jewish messiah who managed to build quite a following, spreading and developing the Kabbalistic thoughts of another preceding him, self-proclaimed Jewish messiah, a bit more famous Shabbat Tzvi. If all of that sounds a bit like Chinese to you, assuming you don't know Chinese, it really doesn't matter historical knowledge is not necessary. This is a fascinating, mind-boggling book that I risk to say will be as well received by critics, fantasy lovers, historical fiction buffs, and everybody else appreciating good literature. My favorite book by Olga Tokarczuk, and I read quite a bit of her. <laughs> It has also quite a geographical scope. It takes place in southeastern Poland and Ottoman Empire mostly, but also it travels to various places all around Europe. Then I picked up a senior resident from my shelves, a book I bought in 2014-2015 shortly after it became a finalist of National Book Award. I'm talking about fantastic, atmospheric homage to the life surrounded by literature, An Unnecessary Woman by Rabbi Alameddin. The novel is narrated by a 72-year-old woman living as a recluse within the walls of her own Beirut apartment, secretly translating the great novels of literature. Never those originally written in French or English, the languages she knows, but the ones translated to English and French from other languages. She uses both of those translations, English and French, to write her own version in Arabic. It's been a long time since a book engaged me on both emotional and intellectual levels as deeply as this one. It moved me, it made me laugh, it made me want to run to the bookstore to pick the novels it referred to, and it made me think about the social issues it was addressing. A brilliant, beautiful novel. 
deserving of all the praise it received. And if it wasn't enough, it seriously is a little compendium of what's the best in the non-English world of literature. Basically, on every other page, you have, in essence, a witty review of various books by Pessoa, Zebold, Bolaño, Javier Marias, Calvino, Schultz, Buenos Molina, and many, many others. I cannot express eloquently enough how much I loved it. The last physical novel I've read in January, but don't worry, the novels in form of audiobooks coming, and quite a bit of non-fiction both in physical and audio form. But the last physical novel I've read in January was another Knocking My Socks Off novel by Kazuo Ishiguro, Never Let Me Go. A few years back, I've read The Remains of the Day, and this is one of my favorite novels I ever read. I liked it so much that I have this edition, that I've read, and then this one and this one. I'm not really a collector of multiple copies of the same book, but I wanted to have a nice edition of the book I liked so much, and then I just didn't remember what I had, and I bought another nice edition, right? In January, I finally picked up Never Let Me Go, and because, because it's much more so much more widely read than Remains of the Day, I was expecting it to be a bit lighter, more accessible version of being a young adult type of a novel. While surprisingly enough, Never Let Me Go turned out to be probably one of the strongest novels addressing our fear of mortality, inevitability of loss, and fruitless efforts to become immortal, mostly through the arts we create. And I admit I teared up once or twice towards the end. What's great here, on the plot level, it's a novel driven by three young characters trying to figure out own way in this dystopian world, which in itself is pretty fascinating, but only when read between the lines, the punch in the gut throws the reader off balance. Brilliant. Now, physical nonfiction. I will start from a little gem, but it's more of a gem when connected with a project that it represents, that I had absolutely no idea about. To Catch the Rain, inspiring stories of communities coming together to harvest their own rain, and how you can do it too, <laughs> by Lonnie Grafman. Lonnie Grafman is an environmental resource engineer. What does that mean? He is a person that works with various communities around the world to use available sustainable resources to meet their pressing needs. Yes, it's about sustainability. He is a man behind, and this is the gem completing this book, Apropedia, a sustainable wiki. This is the website where you can find all useful information for sustainable living, Areas it covers include energy, food, water, and other information and projects to learn from. Let's go, for instance, to solar energy, a page explaining everything you need to know to start using solar energy yourself, including technology and how to build it. It's really a brilliant site. To Catch the Rain is Looney Grafman's first publication addressing the pressing issue of water supply and how to harvest it. In this tiny book, you'd find information about the technology, about how to build it yourself, how to calculate needed parameters. So from one hand, it's a technical book, but on the other hand, you'll find inspirational stories of communities Luna himself worked with to help them build infrastructure to harvest the rain. Brilliant stuff. And no, this is not a sponsored video, but I was contacted by a publisher with a question if I would like to read this book. And I said yes, since I believe that the years ahead of us are a bit grim. So it's important to arm oneself with a knowledge, right? Knowledge is a power. <laughs> okay, I stop. I stop. Talking about grim times, Harald. Welzer, his German, and his climate wars, with even more shocking subtitles, why people will be killed in the 21st century. 
This was the book I read next, and sorry it's getting a bit darker in this video, but this is the last book of that nature, okay? Harold Welzer, before he started working within a wide cycle of climate activism, was a scholar, and, and still is. He researched genocide mostly in 20th century, I believe. His main area of interest was socio-psychological aspects of genocide, how societies develop from relatively peacefully coexisting next to its minority neighbors to a uh, killer machines deprived of any compassion what type of social semi-official institutions facilitate that behavior what construct philosophies we create to arrive at digestible set of values that allow us to agree our pre-killer morality with the killer one all of that all of that expertise from his genocide studies, Welze applied to the climate crisis, starting from historical examples like Darfur, thought to be the first climate war, and then talking about conflicts where control over natural resources was one of the pivotal elements to those conflicts. He didn't stop there, as the title of this book already tells you. He continues uh, his analysis to arrive at a pessimistic vision of future conflicts caused by the deteriorating conditions of living, mostly in the southern hemisphere of our planet. A fascinating book, if it wasn't only so dry, if it wasn't so dry, I would recommend it to everybody, but now I will just say it's a very thought-provoking and very informative position, but brace yourself for quite an academic read. It definitely is not a popular non-fiction. Definitely not. And that gets us to the part of the video I like to call the books I'm running with. I will finally record a video about my morning routine, but just to explain this part, I run. I pretty much always run. That was my main sport when I was in school. Then I had a bit of break, but a few years back, probably close to 10 years back, I got back to running and this time it's rather a longer distance running. I ran 5k four times per five days of working week and then one longer run, let's say 15 kilometers on average on Saturday or Sunday. While running, I listened to audiobooks. I had a period when I listened to music, but audiobooks work better for me. And in January, I managed to finish four of those. Three fictional ones and one very long non-fiction one. Starting from fiction, I picked up two novels that I haven't read from the New York Times list of 2019 top 10 books of the year. The first one was Disappearing Earth by Julia Phillips. It's more of a short story collection rather than a novel. It's set in Kamchatka, Russia, focusing on a group of women having various reactions to the story that broke local community. Two young girls were kidnapped by some deviant. Good writing and storytelling, but also it's quite a problematic book. Throughout the whole time, I was trying to figure out if Philips, the author, has any links to Kamchatka, and after my research, it seems there's none. That's probably why all women, be it indigenous or Russian, sound like their Western counterparts. Good writing and storytelling, as I said, but one cannot stop thinking about unnecessary exoticism and maybe cultural appropriation. I mean, there are many reasons to write about cultures different than your own. But here, there is no reason for it. There is really no reason I found, neither in the story itself, nor in Julia Phillips' life that connects her to that Russian peninsula. The plot is not based on historical events, I believe. The abductions of young girls is as scary in sunny San Francisco as in freezing Kamchatka. It just feels a bit silly to set your novel in a place so randomly. Unnecessary exoticism is the best description I have. The second book from the New York Times 2019 best books list that I picked up was one that I'm still not sure what to think about. And I'm talking about The Topeka School by Ben Lerner. Looking at it 
From one angle, I think that Lerner did something great here, as he, in a very subtle, not in your face way, painted the spectrum of current social and also political divisions. When you read about this book, you often hear that this is Lerner's take on toxic masculinity. The Topeka School is a narration led by various characters, told from multiple perspectives. It's also semi-autobiographical, as the central character is a school debate champion like Lerner was. The problem is that audiobooks are sometimes more challenging medium, as you hardly ever consume them in solitude, in a stationary position. They are sort of made to be a complementary activity of sort. And it works fine with most novels, but some books require higher focus, and this is one of them. The problem also is that I made a vow that I won't be buying new books this year. There's one exception I'm referring to later on. And audiobooks using script subscription that I have are pretty much the only way to access the books from 2019 that I'm trying to catch up with as those are hardly ever on that platform in ebook format already. So here we go. The only thing that I changed because of the experience I had with Topeka School is the pace I listen to audiobooks with. So now it's normal speed, not a double speed I used to go with. I know that there are people listening to books at triple speed, but I'm just not buying that. I don't believe you can really get out with much more than a plot from an audiobook listening to it at triple of the regular speed. I will get back to this one when I see it uh, in an independent bookstore in Dublin, Ireland next week. I'm allowed, according to my 2020 low buy rules, to buy one book from an independent bookstore when traveling. So I'm planning to buy this one and I will reread it. Okay, this video is getting scary long. The last fictional audio I listened to was The Wind That Lays Waste by Selva Almada. It's an Argentinian novella translated from Spanish by Chris Andrews. I'm trying to catch up with some well-reviewed translations before the International Booker Longlist is revealed for this year, so that explains. Mm. On the plot level, The Wind That Lays Waste describes interactions between four protagonists. A charismatic pastor and his daughter Lenny are forced to spend a couple of hours at the local garage. In that remote location, they meet a very secular owner of the place, Gringo Bauer, and the boy he raises as his son, Tapioca. The Wind That Lays Waste was originally said to be a short story and ended up as a novella, of impressively well-drawn characters, most of them to my liking, with the exception of self-righteous reverend. But that comes with the trade, right? That's the danger of all ideologically motivated people. I know better than you how you should live, type of reasoning. But I forgive him partially because of his brilliant, sarcastic daughter Lenny, acting as a counterbalance to his lacking any doubt endeavors. This novella received a lot of praise, and I understand that. I understand that simplicity might be a force to reckon with. And in its class, this book is an example of it. Nonetheless, I'm not the type to hail small perfections as there were giants in disguise. You know, having read recently big, multi-layered, philosophically driven novels, this one, as pleasant as it was, fades in comparison. And the last book I've listened to was Making of Modern Economics by Marx Skousen. Just a few words about this one, as it already took 20 hours of my life. This is a very good history of modern economy told through recalling biographies of the greatest economists. It was probably the first time I listened, read to somebody that writes about economy from quite a different angle than my views. Marx Kausen is a professor of economy and a huge supporter of the freest of market there is. Yes, the school of Milton Friedman. Still, 
very informative and it's always interesting to hear not unsupported views of political or social adversaries. I said that there's a reason I divided books into physical ones and audiobooks, right? So it's because of the 2020 goals of mine. Let's refer to them. There were two lists I started this year with, 35 novels I have on my shelves in physical form I want to read, and 25 non-fiction books also sitting on the shelves that I want to read. In order to make it happen, I have to read three novels per month from the fiction list and two non-fiction books from the other list, right? The Books of Jacob by Olga Tokarczuk, An Unnecessary Woman by Rabi Alamedin, and Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro are all on the novels list. So that task is done. Checked. I posted the video about 35 novels so you can easily double check, but I haven't posted the list about 25 non-fiction books. So as far as the latter is considered, you have to take my word for it. The Climate Wars and To Catch the Rain are both on it. Therefore, also checked. And what's the most important, I haven't bought a single book in January. Checked. <laughs> January was really good then. February though... February though is stressing me out a bit. As a side of this mammoth that I'm finishing, this is The Death's End by Sushin Liu, I listen only to a few audios when running. I had one professional exam, so I was busier than usually, you know, with usual work stuff. But yeah, I have some catching up to do, especially that during the next few days I will be reading three novels I requested for a review from publishers. And those are Amnesty by Aravind Adhika, author of Booker Prize winning The White Tiger. This one is being published on 20th of February. I have Weather by Jenny Ophiel, published on 13th of February. And the third book I have is A Paragon by Colin McCann, to be published on 25th of February. McCann, a National Book Award winner for Let the Great World Spin, already sold the rights to this yet-to-be-published novel to Steven Spielberg's film company. Very impressive, right? Big plans, right? However, one of the goals I set for myself this year was not only to read my shelves, which I'm failing at doing in February, but the other goal was to breathe and not go crazy with addressing the goals, as I have a tendency to overdo things. Therefore, if I won't read as many from those two lists as planned, I will catch up during the year. And if not, I allowed myself, when setting up my plans, reference to the original video, I allowed myself a margin of error of 10 books, meaning that the goal is to read 50 in total out of 60 books, right? That are on those two lists. Therefore, by reading five a month, I would complete all of them. So all is well, all is fine if I read, let's say, three from both lists this month, and that's a minimal target, but obviously I won't be picking up another 900 pages novel next, right? Okay, let me know what you are reading and talk to you soon. That's it. It took a long time. Bye-bye, <laughs> guys.